Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The purpose of this unit from our occlusion handbook is to introduce you to certain principles of clinical occlusal examination, also to show you how you can demonstrate on a patient Posselt's diagram from both the sagittal and horizontal views. Also as we go along today we will show you and explain to you the benefits of this knowledge in restorative dentistry and in diagnosis of functional disturbances. Now I will show you on Posselt's diagram from the sagittal view what we will be doing. Depicted is the border envelope of motion called Posselt's diagram from the sagittal view. We start at centric occlusion. This is an easy point to find. This is the point at which if you tell a patient to close their teeth, the teeth will close. Remember also that in drawing this sagittal view of Posselt's diagram, the lines come from an imaginary point on a lower central incisor tooth. From CO, if the patient moves the mandible forward into a protrusive movement, the line shows dips which indicate the lingual and incisal edges of the upper incisor teeth. F on the diagram indicates a maximal protrusive movement. From F to E depicts the maximum opening while the jaw is in a protrusive position. From E to B, shows the jaw closing but before the condyles are in the fossa. At B the condyles are now in the fossa and only hinge-like motion occurs from B to the point called centric relation. Any place on this line from B to centric relation is centric relation. However, on the diagram CR indicates the first first tooth contact occurring in centric relation. Then the small area from CR to CO depicts the, what is called the slide in centric. The R on the diagram depicts the position of the lower incisor tooth when the patient is in rest position and the line from CO all the way down to the maximum opening position indicates the habitual opening pattern of the patient. On a horizontal view now of Fossalt's diagram, we see again border positions. However, this is a depiction of the lines drawn by this lower incisor tooth viewed from the top or in the horizontal plane. Centric relation is the furthest back position. If you move the mandible in a right lateral excursion, the line from CR to D will be drawn. After the patient is in maximum right lateral excursion, if they are asked to protrude the jaw, the line from D to F will be drawn. From F to E represents moving the jaw from the maximum protruded position to a left lateral position. And once again, from E to CR represents the movement in a left lateral excursion. Also depicted in this diagram is IEC, which stands for incisal edge contact. The hatched area called MR1 in this diagram represents what is thought to be the maximum functional positions used when viewed from this angle. MR2, or the white area right around centric occlusion, is the most used portion of this functional area. We will now go to the patient to show you some of the principles involved in the occlusal examination. One of the most frequently overlooked aspects of a clinical examination is the proper seating of the patient. Especially when we're going to attempt to put the patient into centric relation, the patient must be comfortable. 
we would like to have the patient inclined at about a 60 degree angle and the headrest under the occipital portion of the skull so that the neck muscles are not strained. The first measurement that we will take from the patient is probably one of the most easy measurements. This is the maximum opening. In doing this, we use a millimeter rule, ask the patient to open maximally, and measure from incisal edge to incisal edge. This patient has approximately a 32 millimeter maximal opening. If the patient had a significant amount of overbite, we would have to add this dimension to our final measurement. Now I would like to show you the procedures involved in obtaining a centric relation. As I said before, one of the key points is to have the patient relaxed. Another aid frequently used is to place the thumb on the lower incisor teeth and have the patient close until the thumbnail is touched by the upper incisors. Gentle up and down motion aids in relaxing the muscles. Obtaining a proper centric relation record is a matter of feel. It's very hard to teach a student what to expect. However, when you are doing this, especially for the first time, you should try two or three methods in which you get the feel of a relaxed jaw. You should be able to move the jaw up and down at will and not feel the patient's muscles involved in the movement. Once you get this feeling, you can remove your thumb so that the jaw is now arcing along the hinge axis. You can feel through your thumb and sometimes hear the first contact of teeth in centric relation. We will stop now at this first contact. I will remove my thumb so that you can see the incisor teeth as they are in centric relation. Now I'm going to ask the patient to squeeze slowly together so that his teeth now go back to centric occlusion. This is the slide in centric. To measure this, we must measure sometimes three components. The horizontal component, the vertical component, and the lateral component if such exists. The horizontal component is most easily measured with the patient close together in centric occlusion. Close your teeth. We measure the overjet. We have a three millimeters. We now place the patient in centric relation. Hold on. Measure once again, and we have five millimeters. Our horizontal component in this case is two millimeters. The vertical component is most easily measured by having the patient close their teeth together in centric occlusion. Using a pen, draw a line depicting the incisal edge of the upper incisor in centric occlusion. If we once again place the patient in centric relation until tooth contact occurs, we can now see the difference in the vertical relationship. We measure this, and it appears to be approximately two millimeters. So we would call our vertical component two millimeters. Once again, the patient should close in centric occlusion. Note the midlines. Sometimes these midlines are lined up and can be used for a reference point. They are fairly well lined up in this case in centric occlusion. Now if we move to centric relation, we note that the midline has moved to the left. You can see this better now if I have the patient squeeze very slowly back up into centric occlusion. It would be very hard to measure this on this patient. It appears to be approximately one half of a millimeter. We'll do it once more. Centric relation, centric occlusion. On the diagrams, I would now like to show you what he, we have just measured. 
First, we measured maximum opening, which is the line depicted on the top view from CO to E. This on this particular patient was 32 millimeters. We also measured the various components of the slide in centric. The line going from CR to CO in the sagittal view only gives us two dimensions. Also, from the horizontal view, we only get two dimensions, and we must think of these two diagrams together while we are making our measurements. In the lower diagram, which is the horizontal view, it can be readily seen that centric occlusion is not directly in front of centric relation, as was the case in this patient. If there were no lateral component to the slide, centric occlusion would be directly in front of centric relation. Now, showing the full view of the horizontal diagram, our next measurements that we're going to take are the lateral excursions, as on this diagram are from centric relation to D and centric relation to E, plus we are going to measure the maximum protrusive movement, which would be from CR to F straight ahead. On the patient now, we will do this by holding the jaw in centric relation. We will place a pencil line on the teeth depicting where the upper midline is in relation to the lower teeth. It's a little bit off to this side. We will have the patient now move maximally to the right. We measure this distance now from the upper midline to the line that we drew on the lower two. It is 10 millimeters in right lateral. We go back to centric relation again and have the patient move maximally to the left. Once again, measure this. we have approximately nine millimeters. From centric relation, we will measure the overjet. It is three millimeters and have the patient maximally protrude. Measure the difference here, which is seven millimeters Add these together and we get maximum protrusion of 10 millimeters. Once again, returning to the patient, we will show the measurement for freeway space, rest position, and contact vertical dimension. For this measurement, we do not wish to have the patient supported by the headrest or the chair, and we will have the patient sit straight up in a relaxed position with his eyes focused straight ahead and his head held in a normal position. We will use two dots on the face for our measurements here, one below the mouth and one above the mouth. The exact position of these dots is not important. Only the difference in the measurements will be the important factor. We will ask the patient to close his teeth together and relax his lips, and we will measure the difference between the two dots. It appears to be about 44 millimeters. Now I would ask the patient to wet his lips, relax his jaw, and touch his lips together, and repeat the measurement. This measurement is now 48 millimeters. We would then conclude that the freeway space in this particular situation is about four millimeters. However, another way to do this is to ask the patient to relax and just peek in to the teeth to see that the teeth are not in contact and that there is a space between the teeth and it appears to be about three to four millimeters. The significance of this measurement is mainly in full denture prosthesis in which we need to make this measurement in order to provide an adequate freeway space for the patient. 
The next thing we would like to view on this patient are the chewing movements. We're going to have the patient chew some green wax and watch the movements. Patients prefer to chew with their lips sealed, but we will sneak in here and watch. Watch the lower incisors. Imagine that imaginary dot being there. And notice how far the patient moves laterally and in opening during chewing. The patient appears to move from two to three millimeters laterally in about eight or nine millimeters open. He's doing all of his chewing on the right side. This might be noted in the clinical examination and later we would ask the patient, is there any reason why he doesn't chew on the left side? Sometimes in doing a diagnosis examination for a functional disturbance, this would be a very important thing to note. Another thing we would like to do is show during the chewing the palpation of the various muscles which are involved in closing the mandible. Right now I'm feeling the anterior temporal muscles. They are working quite obviously in each chewing closing stroke. I'll move a little farther back and try to palpate the mid portion of the temporal muscle seems to be working also in every closing stroke. And the posterior portion of the temporal, also in this patient, is quite active in each closing stroke. Obviously, without my palpating, you can see that the masseter muscles are quite active. Now we will ask the patient to swallow. During this, we will try to see if any of these muscles are involved in the swallowing. Swallow once more, please. I could feel the masseter muscles contract. Swallow once again. I could not feel the other muscles, the temporal muscles. However, this does not mean they are not active. This is a rather crude way to assess muscle activity. This diagram depicts the typical teardrop chewing pattern from the frontal view. Once again, this is a line which is drawn from an imaginary point on a lower central incisor two. The vertical axis represents the midline in centric occlusion the horizontal axis represents the most caudal position of the mandibular teeth in centric occlusion. Our patient that we examined chewed very much like this typical teardrop pattern. The important thing to note here is that his lateral excursive movements during function were less than three millimeters. In palpation of the condyles during chewing, very little motion can be felt. However, you can tell the balancing from the working condyle by such palpation. In this unit, we have shown how to take certain measurements from a patient in which to represent the facelt diagrams from both the sagittal and horizontal positions plus the chewing motion from the front frontal position. The significance of this knowledge goes beyond filling a morning with busy work in the clinic. This is involved with all dentistry. The excursions and the movements of the mandible in certain positions on this barter envelope are used in setting and mounting casts on articulators. Also, in diagnosis for functional disturbances, the average movements and excursion dimensions known for a population are used sometimes in order to classify a patient as within the normal range or not within the normal range. You will notice that on the patient we just saw during this presentation, the maximum opening was 32 millimeters. 
Some dentists would consider this to be not in the normal range and would consider this patient dysfunctional only because he cannot open more than this amount. However, in the absence of all other symptoms of dysfunctional disturbances, we would not do this. Also, this patient showed quite a large slide in centric. Once again, without reason for doing an occlusal adjustment or changing this patient's occlusion beyond the fact that he did have a slide, we would not consider this abnormal, but normal. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.